Last Friday, we introduced the last topic of the unit for us in preparation for our test this Thursday. We distinguish between two different kinds of collisions. We call them elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. Those two types of collisions both have their own characteristics. Can you tell me what the different can you tell me what they have in common, first of all? What are what do elastic and inelastic collisions have in common with each other? What's similar about these two types of collisions? Sam? Good. Momentum is conserved in each of those collisions. Momentum stays the same. Momentum always stays the same. It doesn't matter how you classify collisions, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, elastic, inelastic. It doesn't matter if you come up with some other way of classifying collisions. The total momentum will always be conserved. That is, if it's an isolated system, if you don't have any external forces. Kinetic energy, on the other hand, isn't always conserved. Which type of collision is kinetic energy conserved in? Elastic or inelastic? Elastic, good. So we're going to say, we're going to put a little check mark by elastic under uh, kinetic energy. We're going to put a little X by inelastic. So if you've got, if you're analyzing momentum and it's conserved, it's not going to tell you whether it's elastic or inelastic. If you're analyzing kinetic energy and it stays the same, then we know that that's an elastic collision um, versus an inelastic collision. One final thing before we check over the homework that we had on Friday. Uh, sometimes when an object collides with another object, the two objects stick together. A lot of times they do, a lot of times they don't. If the two objects stick together, what do we know for sure about that collision without doing any calculations if they stick together? Sometimes we say they entangle. Yeah? We know that it's got to be inelastic. Kinetic energy will be lost every single time if they stick together. What do you know if two objects bounce off of each other and they don't stick together? They bounce off. They hit each other, bounce off like two billiard balls. Good. It could be elastic or it could be inelastic. What would it most likely be, elastic or inelastic, when they bounce off of each other? Yeah? Elastic? Still, still most likely inelastic. Why? Because the vast majority of collisions are inelastic. Even ones that bounce apart are usually inelastic. It's just that when they bounce apart, at least there's a possibility of it being elastic. Does that make sense, guys? Stick together, always inelastic. Bounce apart, usually inelastic. But every once in a while, when they bounce apart, they could be elastic. You guys remember the only truly elastic collisions we can have? There's collisions that we can analyze that are real, real close to elastic, and then sometimes, to the correct number of significant figures, they, they come up to be elastic. But the only truly elastic collisions are, Sam? Yeah, subatomic collisions, where you're dealing with particles that can't be compressed, right? Can't be squished, and you don't have an energy conversion taking place there. All right, two problems that we have for homework here, page 482, number one and two. Any issues with either of these questions? Okay, let's have a look at number one. This one says, a 45.9 gram golf ball is stationary on the green when it's uh, hit by a 185 gram golf club face while traveling horizontally at 1.24 meters per second. After impact, the, the club face continues moving at 0 0.760 to the east while the ball moves at 1.94 to the east. Uh, club face is vertical, moment of impact so that the ball does not spin. Determine if the collision is elastic. Hey, this is a this is a, a one-dimensional collision, right? So technically, the concept of conservation of momentum applies to this problem, right? PI is equal to PF. I think if you started doing PI is equal to PF, I think you'd end up saying, wait a second. Every term I put into this equation, I have already. There would be nothing to solve for there. So I think you'd find that there wouldn't be any benefit whatsoever in doing this. Having said that, it is valid. It's a valid concept because you have a collision. We're looking to see if it's elastic or not. So my little note that I'm going to make to myself there is something like this. Is EKI equal to EKF? Okay, that's my reminder. They bounce apart, so it's not telling me right away that it's inelastic. It's probably going to be inelastic still, but we've got to do the calculation to see if EKI equals EKF. A little bit of red pen stuff. 
I got some grams here that I got to convert here. Meters per second is all good. Uh, everything is east, I think. It is, yeah. So I think we're ready to tackle this, right? The initial kinetic energy is one half m one v one i squared plus one half m two v two i squared. Hey, if these two masses were the same, would they cancel? They would not cancel, even if they're the same here. How come? How come? Yep. It's got to be in every term, not just on one side, but it's got to be in every term on both sides, and it's not in that term. So let's plug in some numbers here now. Uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.0459 kilograms for the ball. Object number one is, uh, oh, it's stationary, isn't it? Okay, so let's say the initial kinetic energy of that guy is zero. Uh, the club is 0 0.185 kilograms times 1.24. Hey, if that was going 1.24 to the west, how would that have changed what I just did? Negative? Negative? Sorry? Who says negative? It should be a negative in there if it was going to the west. Who says no? It should be exactly the way it is. When we're talking about kinetic energy, we're talking about speed. Okay, those are both scalars, right? Direction doesn't matter. I don't care whether it's east, west, north, south, south. I don't care whether it's 37 degrees west of north. The number is the number. It's 1.24. Okay, don't ever pay attention to direction when you're dealing with kinetic energy or speed. Got it? What does that work out to be? 0.185 times 1.24 squared. 0 0.1445 joules. Uh, now we want to round that to three digits so that we can compare it to the right number of digits with the final kinetic energy. So that's going to be 0 0.145 joules. Okay, there's EKI. EKF, 1 half M1 V1 F squared plus 1 half M2 V2 F squared. M1, M1 0 0.0459. Be careful with that, hey? Be careful that you don't make that 0.459. Okay, that would be an easy thing to do, for me especially. I'm bad at converting units, and it's easy to make that 0.459. Divided by 1,000, not 100. Um, afterwards, the ball is moving at 1.94. The club is 0.185, and it's moving afterwards at 0.76. What do we get for that one? 0 0.139, okay, so 0 0.140, the three digits, okay. Elastic or inelastic? Inelastic, right? Kinetic energy is lost. Not a great deal of kinetic energy was lost, 8.05 joules of kinetic energy, but it's still kinetic energy lost to three significant digits. It's not the same number, so this is inelastic. Two objects bounce apart, okay? Vast majority of time, it's still going to be inelastic. While we're on the topic and in the thought and the groove of elastic and inelastic collisions, let's take a look at this multiple choice question, number 16, that's from your booklet. What's the answer to the question? Who says A? B, C, D. Okay, let's have a peek here. These two cars are, are colliding with each other in a T-bone collision, a 90-degree collision. We don't know what the numbers are. We don't know what the masses are, the speeds are, and so on. But we do know if it's an inelastic collision. Okay, that's probably something that we, we, notice, that we should notice, right? We talk about, for every question that we see, we talk about what's the concept that applies, what's the big picture things, red pen stuff, right? One dimensional or two dimensional, okay? Certainly one of the things that we should notice in this, one of the bigger picture things that we should notice in this is that we're told it's an inelastic collision. That's important, okay? That might be something that you notice as soon as you're reading it, before you even finish reading the question, as soon as you see that word, inelastic collision. Okay, when we see that, we automatically know that momentum is conserved, we know that kinetic energy is not conserved. So let's look at 
well, let's look at which option matches up with that. Momentum is not conserved? No, that doesn't work. Okay? Um, C doesn't work for the same reason. Momentum is always conserved. Okay? Immediately before and immediately after. Momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not conserved. B seems to work. Let's just double check D. Momentum is conserved, kinetic energy is conserved. No, that would make it elastic. Okay, so it has to be B. Good. I want to take a look at a couple more multiple choice questions now, not directly related to elastic and inelastic collisions, but still conservation of momentum. Let's take a look at, uh, first of all, uh, question number 17, which relates to the information that you see up here. Okay, we're, I'll, leave, I'll leave this up on the board here, and you guys can just kind of in your head remember what you're looking for. The magnitude of the momentum of the third piece right here. Not the velocity, but the momentum of the third piece. So we'll look at this question. Uh, the magnitude of the momentum of the third piece. This is one of those ones, um, we'll call it the Nathan question, okay, where... Look, we've got the momentum of object 1 and object 2 already, 2.52 and 1.91. And, uh, maybe we want to use that. Since we're looking for the final momentum of the third piece, maybe we do want to use that. Okay? It might save us a little bit of work here. In the end, we don't have to. In the end, we can use mass and velocity okay, the same way as we usually do. But it means a little bit of extra calculation. So in this case, I'm going to do it without multiplying m times v, just taking the value they already have for momentum here. I've got a couple of things, a couple of funny angles here, okay, and one of them particularly bothers me, this 120 degrees here. What am I going to do with that 120 degrees? Nothing. Why? Well, because that 60 degrees measures the same thing, right? The 60 degree angle tells us exactly where piece B is going. The 120 degree angle tells where piece B is going. Which one do I want to use? Which one seems easier to deal with? The 60 degrees. So let's go with that one. If they both tell us this, the, uh, the direction of the same object, why would we need both? Use the 60 degree one. Now the other thing is that we have some angles here that, or sorry, some masses here that are in grams, and generally we want to be in kilograms. Although, I think I have mentioned to you that in, cons in conservation of momentum, we can actually get away without converting units as long as we're in consistent units. Okay, grams, milligrams, kilometers per hour, as long as we're consistent to the question, we're actually okay there. All right, we do have a funny angle. Let's take that off to the side. It's a 60 degree funny angle. Here's x, here's y, and the momentum is 1.91. Remember, I'm dealing with the momentum here. You could deal with the velocity just as, just as well, okay, just as correctly. Okay, I've just saved myself a tiny bit of work here. Cosine 60 degrees is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Uh, and that's going to be equal to 0 0.9505. Let's say sine 60 degrees is equal to the y component over 1.95. Sorry, 0.955 that is, not 0.9505. And that's uh, momentum, right? Nathan, what would you get for this one, y component to this one? one95 sine 60. One point six eight eight, thank you. Now what do you want to do here? Well break it up into X's and Y's. The initial momentum is zero. The final momentum is M one V one F, M two V two F, M three V three F. If we're lucky, the masses are the same and cancel. That doesn't happen here. What's M one V one F? We already know it's 2.52. What's M2V2F? Well, we already know it's negative 0.955. Right? To see, the, to see the benefit of doing it that way? We're allowed to say M times V, but we've already got the value of M times V. So it just saves us a little bit of work here. Get P3F for the x component, whatever that works out to be. Do the same thing for the y component, and then combine them 
But the way I've done it, you're going to combine and using mem momentum as opposed to velocity. And that's okay. You use velocity, that's okay too. Right? Uh, only homework tonight, guys, is quiz tomorrow on elastic and inelastic collisions. Um, we're done the unit, of course. Okay, uh, please um, consider this. Okay, we've got a test coming up on Thursday. Practice all the multiple choice practice questions you can. In addition, you've got a couple worksheets that we have never assigned as homework. Feel free to work on those and ask me questions on those as well. They're not formal homework, but good practice for you. Okay, have a good night, guys.